Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of uh, Coffee Talks. I know I always say this with every episode, but today we really do have a major, you know, a real major player in the market. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say and how he's addressing some of the issues that a lot of us have to face uh, in the industry. I'm very pleased to have Scott Reckler, the CEO of RxR, with us today. Scott, thank you for joining us today. Amir, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, Scott, the first thing I, you know, I want to know is you're one of the largest landlords in the country. A lot of your stuff that you have is focused on the really in the tri-state area, but you're all over the Northeast. And since the pandemic has happened, and you have millions of square feet in commercial office space. One of the things that I'm really interested in knowing, when the pandemic first happened and you got your team together in the conference room, what were the sort of the worst case scenarios you were going over? And what were some of the moonshot ideas you guys were thinking about as this stuff was happening? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a good question. And, um, you know, I, I think it was interesting for us because the as the pandemic was starting to unfold globally, we began to get some insights about that from some of our investors in Asia and immediately set up a, a task force team that would meet every morning um, at, uh, at at nine o'clock, and sort of go through the, the 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 main issues of the day. Where are we seeing things with the virus? What might be happening? Where there might be changes of policy? And you know, did that through February and into early March. You know, it kept escalating, and the number of people on that task force kept kept right. growing. Uh, and the time, people on the task force were all internal people. All, all internal, but we actually brought in public health officials to give us briefings. We brought in people on crisis management to give us briefings. So as, the, as we got closer to seeing what was happening, we began to turn to others to start getting um, you know, insights, intelligence, and learnings that we would be able to adapt uh, as an organization and for uh, the, you know, our clients and thinking about how we were going to navigate if something had you know, continued to manifest itself. And it was really uh, it, was, it was really March, like the first, you know, March 8th or so, where I think we realized this is going to be a lot worse and uh, than anyone anticipated and uh, and began to, you know, start planning, having people uh, thinking about having to work remotely, how to ensure that our essential workers that had to be out in the field um, were as safe as possible. Uh, and also recognizing that this was going to be a moment where um, we had to be really agile because there was no real clarity as to what's right, what's wrong, um, the you know the public health circumstance was changing and was really fluid, and so uh, you know it became a, a major, major all of us consumer of every piece of information we could get to try to help inform us as to how to best uh, best move forward. How, how does a task force like that come together? So like when the when the pandemic started, well, the virus started uh, spreading, you guys just said, hey, this is something we need to do. And these are the people we need to start out the task force with. And who are like the initial people that you would have on a task force like that? Yes, yeah, so you are, you know, obviously our chief of human capital, our, our COO, our head of our development team, um, the, uh, our, you know, our comms team, um, you know, we, we probably, and then all of the partners. So, uh, you know, I think we probably started with a group of about 10, yeah. a, group of, a group of about 60 yeah. um, as we went through the process. Um, and then actually one of the interesting things was uh, as we became clear, this was going to be a longer haul of us having to work remotely and communicate and manage our business remotely. Um, we tapped uh, Stan, General Stan McChrystal to provide us with some of his lessons that when he was the took over command of uh, the, the, the war in Afghanistan, it became clear that it was no longer this centralized command, but it was more of a decentralized command. And he you know, wrote books about you know, the process of, of leadership in a decentralized environment and how you can have that versus the command and control, which was how they had done it before, and, and spent a couple hours with him. And, and from his lessons, basically designed our communications process and our, you know, from a task force to steering committees to working groups that were going to get us through this process and making sure that we were dealing with everything that, that, that came our way. You know, a lot of people don't have General McChrystal's uh, on, you know, on speed dial. It's, <laughs> it's interesting with you, you know, you have, you, uh, you play at such a scale and you have such an impact on the city and the state and on the taxes of it and where people work and live and all of that stuff. And I guess it is easier for you to just pick up the phone and say, hey, 
look, we, we are representing, uh, you know, housing and all, you know, giving commercial space to hundreds of thousands of people. This is what we need. It was the city and the state, were they available to you in terms of like what you need? It's like, hey, we need a city official, public health official to come and talk to uh, this task force. Were they available to you at that time when this whole thing was happening? Yeah, so, uh, you know, on our, on our public health stuff was really, we went more to the healthcare systems and um, and the consulting groups that we have relationship with, right? So I mean that's and that is to your point, right? That's part of our our business is having a, a broad ecosystem of relationships that we can activate at different times. And and by for your you know the people that um, you know that don't think they have it, everyone really has it when you give thought, right? The the key is to say, okay, who am I going to reach out to? Who's best situated to give me advice or connect me with the person that can give me advice? to get to the, you know, to, to better deal with whatever crisis we're, we're going through. And a lot of this, frankly, you know, I learned back in 9-11 when I lived through 9-11, learned again when we lived through Superstorm Sandy. And then this is that you get to a, a psyche of what crisis management means. Right. And how do you adjust and how do you lead through crisis? And you know, the other, I think, key thing is, you know, is, is, is communicate, 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 right? And, and communicate internally, communicate externally. You can never over communicate um, you know, you need to really be having as much dialogue as possible, both to share with people, you know, and give them a degree of comfort and vision and, com and that, uh, you know, a path that you're going to get through it, but also to learn as a feedback loop, particularly in something where none of us have ever lived through this before. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's pretty intense. You know, one of the things as an aside, you know, I keep a journal that I write in every day and every day before I write, I read last year's entry. And reading, you know, the 2020 journal has been like reading a novel because the intensity of each of my entries were, you know, really, I think, reflective of the uh, an uncertainty and anxiety that existed during that period of time. But I, I, I just, it's amazing to me that you spend a day every day writing a journal. I think that's, uh, that's really inspiring. There's, um, in terms of the task force, have you guys ever had a task force like this before or anything similar to it, like during the recession or during September 11th or at any other time? Yeah, no, so again, we, you know, Superstorm Sandy, the Great Recession, you know, we've always focused on task force and working groups. And part of the rationale is, is, is developing an overall plan, right? And the plan would focus on how do we deal with the, with the crisis on hand and making sure that we're, you know, we're, we're thinking through the implications and the public safety and the, and the recalibration of our business in that world, right? To have to go through that. How do we think about um, ensuring that there's um, a ability to help people recover through this and get through the crisis, our community and, and outreach within our community in that period of time? And then how do we also not lose sight of that we're going to have to rebound on the other side? And then if everyone's just focused on the crisis management piece or the community piece, you also miss the rebound piece, right? And so you have separate groups that do this. And what, what we did here was this was March when we went and I created um, with the team a, a program, which we called the March to Memorial Day program, which had the, you know, within that, I think something like 12 different working groups. Yeah. And that was to say, to say, what do we need to accomplish between now and Memorial Day? Because it's unlikely we're going to be out of this situation before Memorial Day. And how right. do we ensure that our buildings, you know, are safe for the occupants that are there, that uh, for the, when people come back, that they're safe and feel safe? What's the world going to look like on the other side of this? And how are we going to be positioned to thrive on that other side and then and work with our communities to recover from right. something like this? And so... Every week, uh, we would have a, uh, while well, we have this, the task force every day, every Friday, we would do a, a March to Memorial Day steering committee that would then go through each working group, um, which was a two to three hour session to see where, where we are. And then, uh, and that became Memorial Day came, and then I went to the leap to Labor Day. Right. Uh, and then when that came, and we still weren't through this, we went to the dash to December. Right. <laughs> so it's the, so. kept pushing it forward. <laughs> And look, you guys have millions of square feet of uh, commercial office space. When this thing was happening and people were working from home and there was all this talk that people will never go back to the office. Obviously, uh, you know, we, we talked at that time and you, you totally didn't believe that that was going to be the case. And that's probably not going to be the case for the most part. But at, at the time, what were some of the things that you were thinking about if like really commercial doesn't come back, let's say for a year or for two years or for longer? 
at that time, what were some of the ideas you guys had for your existing uh, commercial buildings? Well, the, the first thing that, that hit us and that goes back really again to those early days in March was what's the implication to the small business? What's the implication to the restaurateur, that local shop, that, you know, that whole ecosystem that relies on people being in the workplace that activate their businesses? Because right. the reality is when I thought about our buildings and our tenants, you know, they're all, you know, big enterprises. ArcSAR is an enterprise. We'll have the staying power, at least for an extended period of time to make it through this. It's that small business that doesn't have the staying power, right? That was to be the one that was hurt. So the first thing that we did was use all of our advocacy efforts to push for legislation to help support the small businesses to get through the worst of the crisis. Right. Um, and then, you know, we then on our, on our own uh, portfolio, you know, I mean, I, I would say, you know, the first time we were waiting for rent checks to come back and to see what right. our collections were gonna be back in, the, you know, the first week of April, you know, I remember that weekend having conversations with our team and saying, you know, we don't know what's going to happen, right? We don't you know, you know, who knows how this is going to play itself out and what happens if real big going concerns just decide they're not paying rent because they're not in their, their offices. What's our action? How do we respond? How do we manage being compassionate, but also recognizing that if a firm has the capacity to pay the rent, we need them to pay the rent because right. there are firms that can't pay the rent and we need to help those firms, right? And so- okay. And that was sort of where we where we landed, but we weren't sure. And then and the good news is, you know, the first month, you know, we quickly got the 70, 80, 90 percent collected. And, you know, we've maintained over 90 percent collections and uh, throughout the whole process. And look, mo most of your tenants are major tenants. I mean, you right. have major, major tenants there. So I, I would think at that level, I mean, it's, uh, I, you know, those people are, you know, backed up and they're underwritten and there's all sorts of, you know, things protecting you guys in terms of collecting that rent. Did you feel like, uh, did you feel like at any time people were trying to take advantage of that, even at that level of tent, like the tenants that you guys have? You know, we had a, we had a couple of circumstances where I would say there were people being opportunistic, in the sense of not paying rent. And, and let, let me say this: if you remember the early days back in March, and in fairness to people, right, there was such panic in the air. Right, remember all the big companies were pulling all their credit lines and filling up with cash. Right, I mean there was a run on on cash, sure. and so everyone any expense that people could withhold paying, they were withholding paying along the way. So there were a couple that held rent that may have been some that could have gotten more hurt in this crisis than maybe some of other um, tenants. But, you know, I think when we got through that worse and had a conversation that resolved itself. Um, and again, I think our view of being, listen, we need you to pay rent because if you don't, you know, you don't pay rent, we can't help the people that really have no choice. Right? right. And that's the reality. Right. And we're all, and then, you know, the discussion of, you know, you don't pay rent, then we can't pay, our, our real estate taxes, we can't pay our utilities. You don't pay real estate taxes. The municipalities have no funding. The municipalities have no funding. The police you know, the, and the fire departments don't have funding. Right. You can see how this cycle- There's a whole goes. chain of effect that happens. Exactly. This money exactly. doesn't come. And then, and so for the most part, and then did you guys feel like, uh, so obviously I, I, I felt like I saw this to a really great deal where everybody was trying to renegotiate their leases. And I'm sure you guys had a flood of people who wanted to renegotiate their lease. Did you guys entertain those at all? Or were you like, we're sticking to the leases that you signed and that's the end of the story? Only with the firms, again, that legitimately had financial challenges, right? If this, the small businesses, the, um, you know, the, 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 the um, some of the sh uh, flexible work providers, right? That, you know, right. They, they just couldn't be, they couldn't survive in their own context of this, right? So to the extent that there was someone really had a hardship, um, our view was let's, let's, let's um, negotiate, not long-term, but let's get through this process and, and help them get through this process. We also, set up uh, internally for all of our, our tenants and externally for all of the community uh, consulting teams that helped firms file for PPP. Nice. Um, because there was a lot of people that didn't. And so we held webinars for all our tenants, webinars in the community, and then set up a program called RX Volunteer, where we had uh, accountants and lawyers and marketing people who volunteered to support um, the small businesses, non-for-profits and others that needed to help navigating through that or other uh, things to get through, uh, right. COVID, transform their business to, you know, delivery, for example, for restaurants or, and things like that, which got a lot of use. 
Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure they're very grateful for it too. And there is, you know, some of the guys that were like at the same size as you guys are like SL Green and Tishman. And they immediately, when this happened, they started, uh, you know, scouring the world for opportunities of assets to buy. And I feel like when you're at the size that you guys are, it's, uh, you know, it's too late to shift. It's not like you're going to be like, well, we're not going to be commercial landlords anymore because it might not be as appealing. Let's figure something else out. But uh, you guys still stayed mostly in the, you know, in the tri-state area in the Northeast. Were you at any time looking outside of the Northeast for opportunities? Yeah. So, you know, um, we early on said, where we we think we're going to see this, you know, the stress and there's dislocation. Mm -hmm. And I think we came to the conclusion that distress is going to take a little while to manifest itself, right? Because, and if it was going to happen, it would happen first, maybe in some loans that may have gone bad, hotels we thought had the potential of, you know, being an area where distress, but because no one's really lived through this before and was it going to be a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery, a W-shaped recovery, mm -hmm. I think people felt like there was a little bit of a pause, but we did think there was going to be dislocation in um, assets at, 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 that would be good buying opportunities of irreplaceable assets that we otherwise wouldn't have had the chance um, to, to purchase. And like when we came back in the market in 09, as an example, there was that case where office buildings, because people were so you know, unclear about the credit of tenants and the future of, the, of New York, that we bought four and a half billion dollars of office buildings at prices we look back on today and wish we could have done double that, right? At the time we were nervous about it, but it, you know, you wish you could do double. Here, we thought it was going to be multifamily, um, primarily because you think about it, the driver where people were fleeing the city. Yeah. So, you know, the multifamily market had this, this moment in time where it saw vacancy rates at levels that it hadn't seen, you know, in, you know, generationally. And right. then, uh, and then, and so that was, was one. The second thing is a lot of the developers and owners of multifamily were also long condominiums. Yeah. And so that it was added another level of pressure to them to be able to 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 want to sell. And, and so you bought some stuff from Excel, right? You bought some. We bought, uh, we bought about we we, we bought or, or signed contracts on just under two billion dollars of multifamily um, yeah. over the last six months. But things that we've been working on back a year. And what's interesting is when you look at it, when we were negotiating to buy them, and some when we closed, you know, they were 82 percent occupied. Today they're ninety seven percent occupied. Right. They're burning off the concession. So we thought there was going to be a quick rebound in that. And that's where we went long um, on, on that. You know, having as you know, the rent, uh, the new rent laws that came into play a couple of years ago, there was there was a long tail to that where now we're seeing the effects of it. This, and I'm sure the pandemic had a lot to do with this. But, you know, the amount of multifamilies that are on the market now since the rent laws went into place are up 167 percent. So there seems to be still a huge amount of inventory of multifamily for people who are interested in uh, in buying them. Because, uh, you know, like th there was a concern that uh, the mom and pop landlords were going to suffer the most. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing those kinds of people throw their assets into the market so that they could sort of get out of it because they don't see the benefits of it unless they're doing it at your scale. Right. Do you, and so th do you still see a kind of opportunity in multifamily for but, people? Yeah. So, so again, so we focus to your point on class A, right? We're focused on high end multifamily, but where you have seen, you know, because of that perception that you described appropriately based on the, so the rent law changes, people look at that New York multifamily, a lot of institutions shy away from it because they don't want to get involved in what could be politically or have legislative changes that impact the value of it. So for us, that helped remove some competition. Um, but what I will say is the the window of that dislocation closed pretty quickly at the level that we've been looking at in terms of the quality. Um, th th it's much more efficient now. So I think we got in quickly um, and did our two billion dollars worth of, of of deals. But I'm not sure there's many more that are going to be what I'll call dislocation uh, in that in that mix. I mean, you guys are incredibly diverse when it comes to real estate, and you know you have a great uh, cash flowing position. Is, are there other businesses that you can justify to your team and to your investors for RxR to go into? I know you guys, you, you have a tech fund and things like that. Like, what, what are some of those things and how do you explain that to your investors? Yeah, so I mean, look, we, we look at ourselves as, as um, you know, a, a multi-strategy organization, right? So we have, uh, and while it's, you know, all, all alternative investments, you know, with, with office and multifamily and logistics, but we have infrastructure, where, as you know, we've been designated to build two new terminals at JFK, Terminal 6 and Terminal 7, 
Uh, we have a, a you know debt vehicles. Uh, as you noted, we have a digital venture vehicle that that we pursue. Uh, you know, we do um, uh, social impact investing uh, through our uh, qualified opportunity zone vehicles. So we have a, multiple vehicles that we uh, we, in, we invest through, um, and some of them you know, we'll move away from sort of the, the norm of real estate because I think also real estate as an asset class is transforming to be much more of a um, an, an activated, highly curated uh, real estate as a service, right? I mean, that's something we've talked about in the past we've yeah. believed for some time, which is that it's no longer about building four walls and signing long-term leases and just collecting rents every month. You have to activate what happens in those buildings. You have to create a sense of community you have to make them engaging and exciting. And th while that was happening, and we talked about that pre-pandemic, the pandemic just has made that you know that much more important because to bring people back to the workplace when they have an alternative, which is they could work remotely from home, it can't just be coming back to work in your office and sitting on uh, video conference calls all day. It needs to be engaging. Yeah. And part of a landlord's responsibility is to make it engaging. Um, you know, again, for office and multifamily. I, I want to come back to that point, but before I do, can you give us examples of some of the businesses you, you guys invested in that are not necessarily directly tied into real estate? Sure. So we have a, you know, a company that's a dark kitchen, Kitchen United, which again, is business done very well, you know, in, in the post pandemic world where they'll set up, you know, 10 to 20 different restaurants in one setting. And then you can, you know, order from all the different restaurants and the logistics are in place so that a restaurant sort of takes away the delivery part of that equation out of their restaurant into a place that is, is, is that's the primary focus. It's more cost efficient, more productive, better quality, um, and then delivers. And that's something that uh, as a company that's based in um, LA, but now we're opening up in New York and in multiple places around. Uh, it, that around seems to be very like, I guess the ghost kitchen idea. So that seems to be a very popular idea. I know Sam Nazarian, who was, uh, you know, it, uh, was part of the Morgan hotels. He's gone into that and he's put some major investing into that, right. believing that that's going to be a growing business. Exactly. And what are some of the other uh, businesses that you guys right, So I mean, again, so tangentially is tied to real estate, but convene right the, on the conferencing and hospitality side of the, is the business that we have uh, an investment in right now. Um, you know, we formed uh, a SPAC uh, that we're in the process right now of uh, having conversations with potential targets that are, again, tangentially involved in uh, the use of space and real estate and efficiencies and technology uh, that would be uh, beyond the, that. The, well. the initial SPAC was supposed to be for $250 million, and then you, you got more demand for it. So now it's at $300 million, I believe. At $350, yeah. $350, okay. So it's gone up higher. And then that, and you're... you're actively looking for uh, companies to take public. And have you identified any businesses that have gone public as a result of that? Yeah, I, I can't disclose that obviously because as a public company and it's the stocks traded, but let's just say that we, we're making really good progress on multiple fronts. Um, and again, what we bring, right? And this is where we're sort of a differentiator is that we're targeting companies that want to be able to access our customer, right? And understand our domain expertise and so that it's not just a, a trade where they are able just to go public and they're looking for evaluation and there's a, a you know, a, they go to different SPACs and try to, who's going to get the best value. It's, it's what can we bring strategically uh, right. from a business standpoint. And then also we've run multiple public companies. You know, we had our, our Rexin, which we ran and generated 700% return to our shareholders. We formed a student housing company with one dorm in Texas. We co-founded that in 1998 took that public in 2004, American Campus Communities. It's the largest student housing company uh, in the country. And, and one of the things that we like to say is, we're not just about building uh, buildings, we're about building businesses, yeah. whether it's RxR's business or other businesses that we're investing or incubating. And I think you'll, you should expect to see us do more of that yeah. uh, as we continue to grow our business over the next three to five years. And then in terms of actual fund, you had, a, I believe, a, a $1 billion fund that you were going to go and uh, buy distressed properties. Did you feel like that whole distress movement? I mean, I talked to so many people who were like, at any moment now, any moment, these, build, these assets are going to come online and there's going to be major discounts. And I felt like that never really came to be. And maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe it's too early. But you're right. And as I said, I think we always were the mindset that there was going to be more dislocation yeah. than distress. You know, I think the, there still is time for maybe for distress, and that's going to be because there's going to be assets that are now competitively obsolete in a post-COVID world. 
that eventually the price is going to get to a point where the lender will take it over and sell it. But we're not there now and we're not seeing it in mass, right? And the in the scope of things. But the dislocation we saw, and that was the $2 billion I described. But we were also very thoughtful that in our, in our uh, which is, this is one of what we call our flagship funds. So we have the flagship fund, which we do most of the things with, but we also have verticals like a debt fund and just sometimes we have a development fund or infrastructure fund, right? Those are verticals beyond that. But on our flagship fund, it was dislocation and mega trends, which was coming out of COVID, what are the, the, the trends that are gonna be the demand drivers that, that, that will impact real estate and how people live and work and operate in urban centers mm -hmm. post COVID. And so thinking about e-commerce and logistics and, you know, you know, we, we, we did the, the big deal in Massive Queens with Amazon where we're doing last mile logistics. We signed a, um, in, in Red Hook uh, during this period over the last the six months, we signed a contract to buy another big last mile logistics site right in Red Hook um, mm -hmm. in that mix. Same thing with streaming video healthcare, a place where we think that there's been a tremendous amount of underinvestment. Um, and so focusing on investing in healthcare, telecare, life sciences, um, public private partnership with healthcare systems in the New York metro area and other spots around, around the country. Right. Uh, multifamily, um, again, you know, with the view, particularly the urban suburban type uh, strategies that we have been uh, following and we are big believers. Um, the other one that, you know, as people mobility and movement that we're seeing out there that we've been focusing on um, is, is self-storage. And we actually are wow. working on a large billion dollar self-storage transaction uh, as we speak, uh, as we speak right now. So we, we focus the fund, not just on this location, but on those mega trends. And then the things that, uh, that are gonna be obsolete, you know, whether that's class B malls, class B office buildings, some of the hotels, how do we then focus on uh, um, investing in them to adapt their use so that the use is, is in, the, in, in the sweet spots of where those mega trends are driving demand. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter how you look at it, the best use of office space is obviously for you guys, it would be people using it as office. That would be the ideal uh, situation. Uh, but the fact is the demand for office space, especially at the prices that, you know, uh, New York City offices, class A office spaces we're getting are just not going to be at the same price level. Is there any other sort of use for office space you can think of that could demand, you know, 130, 140, 160 dollars a square foot uh, for commercial office space outside of office use? But, 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 so let me, um, you know, just dispute that a little bit. I think, and maybe or maybe reframe it a little. I think that what you're seeing is a flight to quality in mm -hmm. office space, and I think the higher quality office space um, is still able to demand. Um, the, you know, competitive rents. And we saw that like with one Vanderbilt, which SL Green continued to lease through the pandemic to 90% and getting rents north of $150 a foot as they went through that process. You know, um, so, I, well, I think there's going to be some market correction that needs to happen over this, you know, as, as we work through where we are. Um, and then maybe that takes through, you know, this year and into next year, and maybe a little bit into the year after that. Eventually, I think if you own high quality, class A, well-located space in New York, you're going to be able to demand the rents that justify that. Where I think that you're not going to is in more of the commodity buildings. And I think, you know, the analogy is, I, I, is what happened in retail, right? It used to be that uh, people would go shopping at any mall, any, any retailer until e-commerce came. And then they said, well, why would I leave my house to buy something unless I was going to a place that was engaging, exciting, and easy to get to? The same is going to be for offices. Why would I leave my house and not just work at home Unless when I get there, I'm in a community, it's easy to get to, it's an exciting neighborhood, it's an exciting building, it's, you know, it's energizing, and so those will do well. The other ones won't, and I think we need policies that in place to help accelerate the conversion of obsolete product, not just office, but hotels, because the worst thing we can have for our communities is have big swaths of, of streets have empty dark buildings on it, malls and other areas, right? That are there. Absolutely. Yeah. So you need to so you need to be intentional about accelerating that, not just because if not, it's going to be weighing down the whole community. And a great example is what happened in Lower Manhattan post 9-11. You know, pre-9-11, all those buildings were filled, you know, nine to five with commercial uses, office uses, and it was never a weekend place. And then there was this transformation post 9-11 where it became a live work play community 
and right. that's helped it stay active and and energized it where now families live down there and and retailers and restaurants are able to thrive i think downtown is as good as it's ever been i mean uh, i mean outside of the pandemic but the infrastructure down there and the, the types of people that are down there beyond okay. nine to five it's uh, i think it's as good as it's ever been you know you said that there's going to be this flight to quality and there is going to be a change in these offices. There's got, you know, the way the offices are designed, more conference rooms and more open spaces. Who is going to have to burden that cost, uh, you know, for, you know, in, in some of these major buildings? Because at the same time, you know, we're talking about adjusting the price per square foot. And on top of it, there's got to be some sort of a rebuilt and refurnishing and, you know, different use for some of the space there's going to be a cost involved in that and it's going to be heavy i mean you know for somebody who has millions of square feet of office space how are you guys thinking of how you're going to sort of put off that cost or That's deal true. with it yeah, so so uh, again from our standpoint we have been of the mindset for the last um you know few years that you, you they, that the office itself needs to be a community there's a merger of home and work life and we need to have the the type of amenities and programming and hospitality and services and technology that give people that level of personalized service that they feel that they're getting that energy. So we've been investing that and have our been in our plans and in our business plans, we buy buildings along the way for the, for the buildings themselves. Interestingly with tenants, what you're seeing is many of them are moving, right? So if they're, if they're, if they're today looking and saying they're gonna you know, wanna get a, an office that's you know, sort of set up for a post COVID world, they'll relocate and as part of that build out of them relocating, we'll give landlord contribution. They'll obviously make an investment, but you'll start and you'll be able to build the space that you know is more con uh, consistent with what you'd want in a post COVID yeah, world. Absolutely, but who is, th that's gonna be a major additional cost. Like if, uh, you know, the, the new piece, is that cost, is that uh, money coming from another place that you're not spending any more money into, or is that just going to be something that you guys have to? Uh... Uh, I, think, I think it's going to be, you know, a, a, a burden that the landlords are going to have to pay and um, companies are going to have to pay. You know, I think one thing that's got to be, you know, what's clear to me, and it's interesting in our conversations with companies. Now we moved away from everything being with the head of real estate or head of facilities. You have the, the chief of human resources and human capital are involved as well, as well as the COOs, right. because they realize that they're now going to be experiencing hybrid work like they never had before. No one knows how this is going to work. Everyone has a hypothesis. Right. No one knows, but everyone knows that they need to focus on it more than ever. And yeah. so, you know, this is you're really working in partnership with particularly with your bigger clients about helping them think through what it's going to look like how it's going to be played through maintaining the agility that when you're actually watching, you see how it really works. You can change the space to meet how people are using the space, which is going to be different than what you hypothesized when you actually designed the space. Right. So when do you think we're going to get to a place where we're like, this is the right way to go about it. I, I feel like until people actually come back to, to the office and demand their people to come back to the office, because, you know, there's a situation where, some employees are like, look, if I have to go back to the office, I'm going to look for a different job. And then some of the employers are taking advantage of that. They're like, hey, come work for us and you can work remote. You know, so there's, you know, there's that split that, uh, yeah. that so, so, gonna... so of all of our, I have not heard from any of our clients that they don't plan on coming back in, into the office if they're not there now. Yeah. Um, by the, the uh, sometime in September into the fourth quarter. What, what percentage do you think that is right now? What percentage of your office is occupied as of right now? I, I would say across the spectrum, 30%. I think by September, we'll have uh, uh, almost 100% of our tenants back. But to your point, the, the back won't be what it was before. Some will have hybrid work, some will have flex work. So maybe they're in the office three days a week, they're in the office four days a week and people are working remotely those other days, right? And that's really, I think, gonna be a paradigm, but right. they're gonna be back. And then to you know, answer your question about when we're really gonna know how it all works. So by the end of the year, I think everyone's back, but I yeah. think it's a year of people, you know, get over the anxiety, get back in the office, start trying to figure out how what's working, what's not working, and then taking a step back and reflecting on it, right? So there's gonna be a period of time where I think we're gonna, that's why I, I, we stress to all of our clients, you know, you need to maintain you know flexibility in whatever you're doing because this paradigm is going to continue to change as things unfold 
You know, I, I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable talking about this, but the last time we met, you know, it, the city was sort of, it felt like the city was spiraling. Like it felt like nobody was manning the ship. And, uh, you know, and we met and it, it's funny, in the, I go to these different circles of people within the city and that everybody sort of agreed that there was a lack of leadership. And one of the names that kept coming up over and over was your name, you know, as that like, look, we need somebody like Scott Reckler to go and uh, run for mayor, or we need somebody like Scott to go and uh, be governor. He would have the support. And, you know, when I brought this up with you, you said that you felt like you could do more for the city from the outside than from the inside. And do you feel that, do you still believe that uh, idea that you could do more from the outside than you could as somebody actually leading the ship? Yeah, again, I think, you know, when I think I remember that conversation and I think, you know, part of what I was saying was that when you're an elected official, you got to, you know, uh, battle the, 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 the politics and the, and I always call it sort of the, the, the ghost of the, of the electorate, right? You have to always, you're looking at polls and, it, and you can't necessarily, you know, be fully true to what you think needs to get done. When if you're not elected, you can just keep pushing forward and try to influence change in the way that, that, um, you know, is, is, is pure towards that change. I do think that, um, you know, the, as we look at to where the city is now versus when you and I met a year ago, um, I, I, I would, I, I, even as an optimist that I am and believer in this city is going to come back strong, um, I wouldn't, I, I couldn't have imagined it coming back as strong as quickly as it appears to be doing right now. You know, the fiscal crisis in the short term at least is dealt with because of the support we got from the federal government and the help with Chuck Schumer bringing that here. Um, when you look at the political situation, which, you know, I think could have been. Um, you know, more extreme positions in terms of the mayor and the city council turn out yeah. to be more people that are less ideological and more focused on the challenges at hand and focused on public safety and quality of life, uh, which I think is critical right now. And I think that we all need to not think about this being a, a, you know, a tale of two cities, but one city with one united vision of how we're going to make it a stronger, more equitable, more prosperous city that we all believe in and we all work hard to get done. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing to me that, you know, I, I, I feel like the mayor or the president or the governor, you know, they should want to unite everybody. And, you know, we've had these situations with these politicians who tweet out things like tax the rich. I mean, when the mayor of the New York City, which is the capital of wealth and, you know, and of course, a lot of taxes come through it, allows it to be the city that it is. When, you know, he tweets out something like tax the rich, I mean, that must like, you know, make you boil and say, what are you doing? You're already done so much to scare away people, you know, from the city, you know, and to tweet something like that out. I don't think it's um, it was great, but uh, you know, you have access to a lot of information. Uh, you know, like we said, you can pick up the phone and call General McChrystal and call the governor and all these people. You have access to information that most of us don't have. You have some clear ideas, obviously, on how the city should be run. Uh, if you were to be a dictator tomorrow of New York City, you didn't have to deal with city council or anybody else. What are some of the things that you would implement immediately as the leader of the city? It's um, a good question. I, a couple, you know, I, I, some of them which we talked about. I mean, I think that you know we'd have to deal with this inequality issue, right? In terms of, and I think that it was being more apparent and more pronounced during COVID, and focus on those communities and what are some of those deficiencies with the healthcare systems, with access to broadband, so that you know, I mean, today any family, any child that doesn't have broadband is like not having electricity. Right. In the old days, right? You have to have it to be competitive. Um, you know, so really trying to, you know, focus on those communities, on health, education, um, and making sure those resources are in place. Uh, focus on, again, the public safety of the city and the perception of public safety that needs to be dealt with. And I think got to get, you know, um, guns off the street. Um, I think we need to be give judges, um, you know, more latitude in determining, um, you know, who should have parole or not have parole so that, that we don't recycle convicts, uh, you know, the, that shouldn't be on the street to the, can be repeat offenders. Um, I think, you know, dealing with the homelessness crisis, we need to bring in uh, more social support services to solve the problem, to help, you know, bring people that, um, that need the help to get back into um, everyday life, get back into everyday life and mental health issues be dealt with. 
Is, is um, it more that we need the social services or that the social services need to be managed better? Because I, you know, there's so much money that goes into this stuff. And then when you break it all down and calculate it and divide it up of how much is going into what, how much is supposed to go into each person that needs it. And you wonder to yourself, how, like with that much money going to each of these individuals, some of it, some of it at least should be fixed. It should be going at least in the right direction. Right, right, and, right, and I, you don't I, really feel like that's happening, you know? I think you're, I think you're right. And um, I think that's the issue, right? I think it's not the dollars. We're not solving the problem with money. We're yeah. solving the problem of how that money's spent. Right. right. And I think that's across the spectrum. And I think you're 100% right, is that we need to spend money to solve problems more effectively. Yeah. And a lot of times we're, we're spending money to put band-aids on the problems versus solving the problems because maybe we don't want to deal with the political reality. Maybe the bureaucracy is too difficult to navigate through. But if you gave us the, the dictatorship, I think we could solve them. In a, in a, in a, maybe not the best word I use, but you get the idea. Well, uh, Scott, I really appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much for this. Any last thoughts uh, for everybody in the industry who's sort of listening to this? You know, I, mean, I, I appreciate your taking the time. And my, my last thought is we're all in this together. We got through this together and now we got to rebuild uh, our city to be uh, you know, more equitable, more prosperous together and all take responsibility for it. Not point yeah. fingers, not rely on others. Um, you know, we all got to be accountable to make it a better, stronger city. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you everybody for tuning in and see you next time.